Hello, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast channel. I'm your host, Isaiah, and today we're going to talk about two things, Tesla's new V4 cabinets, as well as Tesla's bold claim that's saying within the next 18 months, that means mid-2026, we will see more V4 posts than V3 posts. If you are a non-Tesla EV driver with access to the Tesla supercharging network, you know how frustrating it is to pull into a supercharger and have to take up two stalls with Tesla owners maybe giving you a pretty weird look. Now, Tesla says that they will be retrofitting a lot of V3 stations to have V4 posts. V4 posts are taller, they have longer cables that can really reach any configuration of the charge port. This is going to mean a lot for electric vehicles, particularly non-Tesla electric vehicles, and is only going to prog progress the movement of electrification forward. And to help us understand and get some perspective, we have Walter from the network architect channel. Hello, Walter. How are you doing? Very well, Isaiah. It's a pleasure to be on board. Awesome. I'm glad that you're here. So we have an update coming directly from Tesla about the improvement of charging for all. And that's what they've named the title of this article, improving uh, charging for all. And so it says here, we open this Tesla supercharging network to be helpful to all EV drivers and car manufacturers going electric. However, different charge port locations on other EVs aren't great when charging on shorter cable superchargers. Below are our recent efforts to continuously improve the charging experience for all drivers. Now, essentially what they're talking about is they're going to, over the next 18 months, Tesla will deploy more long cable V4 dispensers to better accommodate right, various charge port placements. Then there will be improved stall availability estimates. So Tesla's latest software update enhances the accuracy of stall availability by detecting EVs with non-standard charge port placement. So if you have a Rivian R1T like me, for instance, and you pull into a Tesla supercharger, you are technically going to be occupying two spaces. Now for Tesla owners, they'll see on the screen there. And I imagine even people who are using the Tesla app will be able to see that, well, there are two stalls occupied even though only one charger is being used. And then also Tesla is now going to be encouraging a standardization of charge port locations for all automakers. But then again, right, we are going to see the introduction of V4 stalls um, and cabinets. We'll talk about the V4 cabinets in a second. And with the V4 stalls and dispensers, right, we're seeing longer cables. So it really kind of curbs some of this. So Walter, that was a lot there. <laughs> you are, um, you said you have a lyric in your family. So you are somewhat familiar with how weird it is plugging in your non Tesla vehicle in a Tesla supercharger because the charge port is in the front left, like my Raven, the charge port's in the front left. And that is opposite to how Tesla charges right where Tesla has the charge port placement. So Walter, what are your thoughts on these improvements from Tesla? Yeah, so I was a both YouTube content creator and a General Motors owner who was waiting with bated breath for the Tesla supercharger network to open. And there was a massive delay. I don't know if we remember the history here, but there was the dismissal of the supercharger team followed by some lagging responses on when the supercharger was going to be open to General Motors customers. So I found myself at superchargers quite a bit trying to just check to see because when Rivian's got access, basically the weekend prior, there was a soft opening of sorts where Rivian owners were able to charge uh, using like a Mach-E as their uh, vehicle. And it would actually work because they were able to the identification of the vehicle was already inside the ecosystem. And so they were able to actually charge. And I was kind of looking for that when General Motors was going to have like a couple days where the uh, either the VINs or the MAC addresses of their cars were in the ecosystem and able to charge. And it actually didn't happen. So I believe, and just to be clear, I did not know about this whatsoever. This is the first I'm hearing of this news. So it is very exciting. So what I believe they're talking about is that when a vehicle pulls up to a Tesla supercharger post, it's going to be able to identify the make of the of the vehicle and then do a analysis on the location of the stall and whether or not a adjacent stall is then nullified as a result of the charge port being in the wrong place and therefore marking two stalls as unavailable in the Tesla app in order to uh, steer 
uh, Tesla owners away from uh, possibly showing up to a station that's all all full. And I might be off the mark on there, but I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And if so, that is a pretty clever way of trying to solve a problem that has been kind of like brewing now for probably about a year or so. And um, in my particular case, so I have a, a Volvo XC40 recharge, which actually has the charge port in the correct location uh, for Tesla supercharger um, stall optimization, same as uh, Tesla. But the Lyric, not only, as you say, is it in a similar location as the Rivian, but it's actually pulled back a little bit. So in order for me to get into a Tesla supercharger V3 stall, I really have to nose in. And with the Lyric and the front cameras and everything, I could do so, but we're talking inches away from actually knocking over a pedestal. And what Tesla recommends is you go in between two pedestals and you kind of nose in and that way you kind of protect it. Um, but um, so my initial impression is it's a very clever solution to something that has kind of become a simmering problem. You hit the nail on the head there with now telling Tesla owners, right? So they're not being now telling Tesla owners, so they're not confident in there being stalls available. And when they show up, there aren't stalls available. So this will helpful, hopefully curb that situation that we're currently seeing. Um, now for your Volvo vehicle, you recently got Tesla supercharging access. We did. Uh, yeah. How have you ha had a chance to try the Tesla supercharger network with your Volvo? Well, it's actually further than that. I've been a long time EVgo member where I actually pay every month in order to get discounted rates. And I'm getting ready to do holiday travel. And I looked at what I had available to me and I've actually made a decision actually just this weekend in order to switch from EVgo membership to Tesla supercharger membership. Wow. Uh, the price is the same. The, 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 pr the membership price is the same. The discount you get as an EVgo member is a little bit steeper, but there's more Tesla superchargers. So for me, that's really advantageous. Plus they open multiple superchargers really close to routes that I frequent with regularity. And so all those things combined, I switched from being an EVgo member to a Tesla supercharger member uh, just this weekend uh, because my Volvo has the port in the right location. Now, my Lyric has two years of free charging at EVgo, including the Pilot Flying J stations. Um, I don't know what I'll do once the free charging ends on the Lyric because it's, it's different to have a charge port in the wrong location. And um, there, there's several factors there. I, one of those factors I imagine being, right, the introduction of more V4 dispensers. Um, those dispensers, Tesla supercharger stations with longer cables. And if you saw more of those out in the wild, I imagine that would persuade you to right, add the supercharging subscription for your Lyric as well. I would. Yes. Luck luckily it hasn't been an issue so far, because as I said, we're pretty, um, confined to EVgo stations and the pilot flying J build out has, uh, interstate corridors pretty well, um, filled with new charging stations that for us are free. So for the us, you know, free 99 is the right way to go. And plus they're really nice stations right off the interstate, all that fun stuff. Um, however, in, you know, if we could kind of look into the future and see, I, I have not seen many, if any Tesla supercharger stations where they've gone in and ripped out, uh, V3 or V2 stalls and put in V4. Normally what they'll do is they'll tack on like a bank of eight V4 stalls. And then you have to hope that when you get there, you'll have access to one of the longer cable ones. Um, what I'm seeing is all the net new stations or most of the net new stations are coming with V4 uh, dispensers. And there's so many in the ground now, really what you're looking for is access to the ubiquity uh, being a Tesla supercharger member. And if most of those are V3 uh, dispensers, uh, you're stuck with the short cable situation. And there's actually more to it than just the short cable, but uh, we could stick to that one issue. So I'm actually cu curious to, to hear more what other, I guess, problems with the size and the supercharger configuration for V3 do you see? Well, there's, there's two things. There's 
One is the philosophy that Tesla brings to charging, which because of the history, the goal of the supercharger network was to provide a means for a Tesla owner to do road tripping and charge within their town conveniently and reliably. That was their mission. The situation has really evolved. Now it's a lot more driver focused amenities. And I can't tell you how many superchargers I've been to where, you know, the mall is closed or you're tacked on to the tail end of a strip mall and sure you have reliable charging and everything, but what if I want to use the restroom or go inside and get a soda? Um, lots of times the uh, site location selection has not been optimized like it has been as of late, they've been doing a lot better job of it, but there's so many in the ground that are in these, you know, back end of anchor mall uh, parking lots and things like that. Um, so there's that issue, but the bigger issue for me is, um, me and my wife going on a road trip, stopping at a supercharger station. And I have to be candid. Uh, some Tesla owners are frustrated that we're taking up two stalls. And the truth is we're doing what Tesla says to do. Right. Um, and so there's a bit of a witch's brew that's kind of forming when you go to a Tesla supercharger station and you never know what's going to happen. And that alone to me is enough to say, if there's another option, I'm probably going to take another option. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, you know, even in my own city where there are multiple superchargers only recently have they started adding superchargers in locations where there is some sort of 24 hour access and and that is one of the the benefits especially of larger gas stations um you'll see on interstates is that the gas station is primarily open 24 7 for people to access um and now the superchargers near me are actually being put on property of gas stations but yeah it is a bit of a witch's brew right we have tesla the corporation saying, hey, you know what? Everyone can use these superchargers. Um, we're fine with this, but it's not being communicated with Tesla owners that, hey, other people are going to be using the Tesla supercharging network. They're, in some cases, they're going to be taking two stalls. Um, I understand that and understand that this is temporary and might be an inconvenience for you. It's for the betterment of electrification. Um, and so I, I think, right, not only putting superchargers in a better location, communicating this with Tesla owners that, hey, guys, other EVs are going to be using the Tesla supercharging network. For the meantime, it's going to be a bit awkward, but also seeing a build out of V4 dispensers, particularly V4 cabinets. And I kind of wanted to segue this into the introduction of V4 cabinets. Um, so recently, just a couple days ago, Tesla is now introducing the V4 cabinet. So right now, technically, the V4 dispenser that we'll see on screen here, this is just a dispenser. It's actually counted as the version 3.5 dispenser. So although, although uh, in the community, we'll say V4, it is really 3.5 um, until it gets the cabinet. And so in 2025, the first half of 2025, we'll now see V4 dispensers here, these long dispensers with the V4 cabinets, which should enable 500 kilowatts for EVs. And of course, for the Tesla Semi up to 1.2 megawatts. Um, so this introduction of the V4 cabinet dispenser, these stations, also will help those 600 volt, 800 volt EVs that are currently getting right 100 kilowatts on EV stations on current Tesla supercharging stations with V3 cabinets, where it's, it's kind of awkward because you're getting slow charging, although right, the Tesla supercharging network is everywhere and it is reliable. Um, it, it can kind of be frustrating because you're getting low speeds. And so these V4 cabinets should help with that. Now, I want to ask you, Walter, compared to how right, EVgo and the pilot flying J stations are configured, do you think Tesla should continue to build their V4 stations, especially with these V4 cabinets, these V4 cabinets that, that we'll be seeing? Do you think that we should continue to see this configuration of V4 stalls kind of in these parking spaces? or maybe something similar to how we see gas stations, um, something a large 
covered space connected right to a gas station. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, during the time where we were seeing a downturn in electric vehicle um, accelerated adoption, I guess is a good way of characterizing it. Tesla was curtailing spending in multiple different ways, the Tesla supercharger team being dismissed being one of such example. But one thing that was quietly still occurring during the time of curtailing of spending at Tesla was the Tesla semi plant construction continued. And it was almost, it felt like it was being fast tracked. Like the Mexico plant was put on hold, but the Tesla semi plant was still going forward. So in this phase of what is uncertainty concerning the acceleration of electric vehicle adoption. And personally, I think it all boils down to the price of batteries and nothing else really matters. If the battery prices are low, the electric vehicles are gonna sell. But during this phase of a cloudy adoption acceleration occurring, one thing that is not going to change is fleet operators see the economics of going electric being beneficial. And for them, it's just an economic decision. And the Tesla Semi falls into that. So I personally think that the V4 cabinet um, being introduced the way it was is a direct result of the Tesla Semi factory starting to get uh, progress towards production. And they need a charging network in place in order for Tesla Semis in order to be functional. Right. So the answer to your question is yes, I think you're going to see Tesla or you're going to see uh, tractor trailer uh, types of stalls okay. in new builds. Whether or not they have canopies or not is really in question. But I think at some point in the not too distant future, every Tesla supercharger station that is going to be put in is going to have V4 dispensers, V4 cabinets, and stalls in order to accommodate semis. That is a really good perspective. I, I didn't even think about it like that. Um, with the ramp up of the Tesla Semi, right, you're going to need places to charge the Tesla Semi um, as it branches out and not, you know, is collectively placed between California, right, where they have a couple V4 cabinets set up just for the Tesla Semi. Production will start and they'll have to start, right, delivering these across the country. And you're going to need the infrastructure to, to support that. And it would make sense, right, to have these almost, I imagine, uh, tractor trailer, right, sized chargers placed for these semi trailers. So that was, that's, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my personal opinion is that the uh, fleet is going to remain a accelerated adoption just because the economics right now are unquestioned. And you see a lot of like the United States Postal Service is proceeding with their electrification plans. Of course, uh, Amazon and FedEx, UPS, uh, the list goes on. Uh, Walmart has recently announced they're doing the bright drop for their food delivery. Um, so electrification in fleets is definitely uh, continuing unabated. Awesome. Thank you so much for that perspective, Walter. Um, I'm really curious to see how this actually rolls out, right? Tesla says, Hey, we have this update here. Um, but to see it in action is really what I'm, I'm hoping for. So maybe we'll provide an update and I can have you back on and we'll be able to talk about this further, but thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. This is the Out of Spec podcast. I'll have Walter's information linked in the description below. Again, we hope to see you guys in the next one.